so our next presenter um, for Grand Rounds is going to be Caleb uh, Morris. He's a third year medical student who's visited from Duke for the past 10 months or so and spent some time in the Mammoth Warner Laboratory. Uh, he's done a great job and uh, he's dreading going back to real medical school here in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Dr. Werner is going to introduce him a little bit with the, introduce his talk a little bit uh, before we hear from him. Thank you very much. Good morning. So this is just a brief introduction to Caleb and Caleb's subject. Um, so here you have the structure of our lab actually, and here you have our current fellows, and they are finishing this week. And here are new fellows. They already started last week. And we put here Caleb as honorary fellow because he actually spent a total of 10 months with us and this is also his uh, last week. Just for a moment, so how is it you go from three women fellows to three gals? You can't make this up any other year. That's <laughs> going to be a very interesting transition, no doubt. <laughs> so yeah, we couldn't do three women again. <laughs> <laughs> kind of need a break, I think. <laughs> No, we had a great year, and I'm sure you're going to have another great year. So, in any way, so Caleb comes from Duke University, and for him to be here, Duke University <coughs> required him to have a major project. So he was involved in everything we did in the lab, but he had a larger involvement in this particular um, project here. So as an introduction, you are probably all familiar with the term of glistening, which are these fluid field microvacuoles that we are going to observe inside the optic of intraocular lenses when they are in the aqueous environment. They measure at around 10 microns in general, and they are throughout the optic substance. They were originally described with hydrophobic acrylic lenses, especially with uh, the acrylic soft material, but they can actually be observed with different lenses. However, you may not be very familiar with the concept of nanoglycinins, and there are a few papers in the Japanese literature calling this whitening of the intraocular lens. And there are a few papers describing this just as surface light scattering. So this was also originally described with a three-piece Acrosoft lens. And I just want to show you what it is. So you have here two intraocular lenses. There are three-piece Acrosoft. You have the explant. Uh, the explant on the left side is actually a lens that was removed from a cadaver eye and it was inside of the cadaver eye for at around five years before the death of the donor. And on the right is the control, is a brand new lens removed from the packaging. So both lenses are in the water bath and for this particular photograph, the light is coming from above. So now I'm going to show you exactly the same lenses, exactly in the same position, nothing was changed. The only thing here that was changed was the lightning. So the light is not coming from above, the light is coming from the sides, from the left and from the right side. The lenses are in the exact same position inside the exact same water bath. So you see that the, there is no change in the control, but these explanted lens actually acquire this whitish discoloration. So that's what it is. And the way you see that in vitro is exactly the way you are going to see under a slit lamp examination. So according to the position you put the light in the slit lamp, you are going to see this Acrosoft lens getting this whitish discoloration. And once in a while you get some emails of surgeons saying, I believe the Acrosoft lens that's inside of the eye of, the, of my patient is calcifying. So it's not calcified, there is no calcification, it's hydrophobic acrylic lenses, which this is. So I like this schematic drawing just to show what actually this is. So you have the optic of the lens here and the glycines are inside of the optic substance and you can actually measure these vacuoles at around 10 to 20 microns. They are filled with fluid, but the whitening or the nanoglycines, they are strictly on the surface of the lens, anterior or posterior surface. And basically these are a small water aggregates that you visualize and they are very, very small. You cannot really measure them, but they give this appearance of whitish discoloration according to the incidence of the light. And in our laboratory, we have a shine fluid device with densitometry analysis. So that's exactly how this lens here is going to look. The outline of the optic is very, very bright, and you can actually measure these in CCPs. That's a measure of brightness. So 
So here the values are very high, more than 100, and the control length is going to look like that, so a very dark outline. So this is just a brief introduction. We are doing a series of studies in our laboratory on this subject, and Caleb then is going to present about some of them. I'd like to thank Dr. Werner for that introduction. Uh, at this point, you know more than I did about nanoglistenings a year ago. So um, hopefully that'll prepare you to, um, to listen to this talk. As Dr. Werner mentioned, the, the initial studies done on these lenses and up to about, the, about when we started the study, these lenses had mostly been studied in a three-piece Akrasoff ILO, a very specific uh, lens and not in other lenses. So the first thing we wanted to know was, is this a phenomenon that's unique only to the three-piece Acrosoft lens, as um, the lenses that are used now more commonly are the single-piece Acrosoft lens. And changes in um, both design, the going from a three-piece to a one-piece, and also material incorporation of a blue light filter in some of those lenses may have, may have changed this presentation. Um, and so what we wanted to know, and our question was, are these um, same, same nano glistenings seen in the other Acrosoft lenses. Um, so the purpose of this first study was to investigate the potential effect of surface light scattering on light transmittance of the single piece hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lenses with or without blue light filter. For our study we obtained 49 hydrophobic acrylic IOLs that were removed from donated human cadaver eyes. 36 of these had the blue light filter and 13 did not. For controls, we had controls that were supplied by Alcon, and they were nice enough to uh, match these to both the power and model of the um, explanted cadaver lenses. We measured the surface light scattering, as Dr. Werner mentioned, on our Shine Fluid camera, and light transmittance was measured on a Perkin Elmer um, spectrophotometer. And it's important to note that we used a single beam configuration um, with an integrating sphere um, set up, and, and we'll talk more about that later. This is a picture of the Shine Fluid camera. Um, on the left here, we have the, um, the specially designed eye model. Um, it mirrors both the curvature and dimensions of the human eye. And we place the, um, the IOL in the inside this holder um, and then fill it with uh, either BSS or distilled water. It's then placed here on a special <coughs> holder that was designed for it on the Shine Fluid camera. Um, for the light transmittance measurements, these were made on the spectrophotometer here. And again, we had to have a specially designed holder that fit into the cuvette. Um, in both cases, the anterior surface of the IOL was faced towards the light source. And it's placed here in the little box. Um, the measurements, as Dr. Werner mentioned, are um, reported from the Steinflug camera in CCTs, or computer um, compatible tape units. And these measure um, brightness of the light that's reflected back at the camera. Um, it's measured from zero, which is black or no light scattering, up to 255, which is white or high levels of light scattering. Here's a picture, a gross image of what we see with the lenses with blue light filter. The top image is an image of the lenses in the dry state. On the left, you have the control lens, and you can see it's very clear. On the right, there is the um, explanted lens. And sorry, some of this is cut off a little bit, um, but I'll tell you what those things say. So on the right, you can see that there's a little, there's few focal um, areas of reflection, um, and these are consistent with Yagpit um, in the lens. In the second image, the lower image, you can see these are hydrated lenses. Again, the control is very clear. On the on the right, the um, explanted lens still has those YAG pits in it. And then there's also some areas you can see a little bit of evacuated focality um, throughout the lens, and those are consistent with glistenings. The most apparent thing, though, is the surface light scattering, and that's this um, milky, yellowish color throughout. And there's no, there's no focality at all to it. It's very diffuse. Here's uh, shine fluke images of these same two lenses, so you can get a, an idea of what this looks like. The top image is the hydrated control. And it has very low levels of surface light scattering. Um, 
about 10 for both the anterior and posterior surface. The lower image is the explant, very high levels of, of light scattering. You can also see in the, in the middle there's a little bit of um, light scattering from some glistenings, but the, the most light scattering is the, the anterior and posterior surfaces, and that's as high as 226, which is quite high on the anterior surface. Again, this is um, same views, but of the lenses without blue light filter. The top image is dry again, and both of these both of these are very, very clear with the control and the explant. Um, in the hydrated state, you can see that the um, that the explanted IOL has some focal areas of, of reflection consistent with glistenings, and then the diffuse light scattering throughout that shows the milky whiteness. And again here, very low levels of, of surface light scattering on the um, control lens and, and much higher in on the explanted IOL. In this case, as high as 151 on the anterior surface. Here's a summary of the, um, the data that we got for the surface light scattering. For all the lenses with blue, with blue light filter, uh, the mean of surface light scattering for both the anterior and posterior surface was 38.4, plus or minus 46.1 CCT. So there's a lot of variation. The range is quite large, from 4.8 to 202.5 CCTs, and that's for the, for the mean value. The control for both were quite low. Um, for the uh, lenses with the blue light filter, it was 5.4 plus or minus 2.3 CCTs. And the lenses without blue light filter, the, uh, the explanted lenses were 64.6 plus or minus 43.6 CCTs. And again, very low in the control. Um, part of the, the reason I wanted to call your attention to the, the large range and the variance in the um, light scattering on these lenses is that these lenses were explanted, and we, we tried very hard to get lenses that had known dates of implantation, um, so we could know how long they were in the eye. And here you see a plot showing the, um, showing on the y-axis the um, CCTs, or the, the light scattering that's occurring, and the years of implantation of that lens. And you see that there's a tendency for that, um, for the light scattering to increase over time. And this is something that was seen in the three-piece lenses as well. Here's a graph of the, the same two lenses with blue light filter, um, the control and the explant, and their pattern of, um, of light transmittance. And you can see that the, uh, they mirror each other very, very well. And in this case, the transmission begins to decrease around 500 nanometers, and this is consistent with the blue light filter. The mean light transmission that we measured, we, um, and also the, the latest papers that have come out on this subject, set the visual spectrum as 400 to 700 nanometers, so that's what we used for this paper as well. Um, the control had an average um, light transmittance through this spectrum of 83.19%, and the explant was 83.20%, so you see they mirrored each other very closely. This is a slide of the same uh, lenses without the blue light filter that you, that you saw previously. Um, in this case, this is the, the typical pattern of light transmission. I'm going down to right around 400 nanometers where the UV blocker takes effect. And in this case, the mean light transmission was 96.88% uh, for the control and 96.06% for the explant. So again, very, very closely matched. Overall, the, for all the lenses that we measured, the mean light transmission for the lenses with the blue light filter was 83.69, and the control was 83.76, so very close. Um, the paired t-test, the p-value was 0 0.4, um, so quite high. Again, the lenses without the blue light filter, similar picture. 95.91 um, was the mean for the explants, and 96.02 for the control. Again, a, a high p-value of 4.487. Uh, so you see um, that they were very similar in light transmission. So for this first study, the conclusions that we had were that surface light scattering was indeed higher in the explanted IOLs, quite a bit higher. Surface light, light scattering appeared to increase with time. The Acrosoft material in a single piece design with or without the blue light filter um, is, al is also susceptible to high levels of surface light scattering due to nano glistening. Um, increases in the surface light scattering did not, however, have a significant effect on light transmission in the visible spectrum in the single piece hydrophobic acrylic lenses with or without the blue light filter. But at the end of this study, we had, we confirmed that, that this phenomenon was still occurring in the Acrosoft lenses, um, but we didn't, 
we, we still wanted to know whether or not this was occurring in other lenses. Was this specific just to the Acrosoft material um, or in other materials, including other designs of hydrophobic acrylic lenses? So the follow-up study that we did, we evaluated surface light scattering and light transmittance in previously unstudied IOL material and design types. And this was our question, is surface light scattering specific to the Acrosoft material? So we had four different material types that we collected, um, hydrophobic acrylic, hydrophilic acrylic, PMMA, and silicone lenses. Um, we had four types of the hydrophobic acrylic lens. Um, the three that have been previously studied, we wanted to enlarge that data set um, and confirm our previous results. And then we also wanted to see um, in, a s in a different material type, the sensor material from AMO, if it had similar results. We had two types of hydrophilic acrylic lenses, um, two types of PMA lenses, and three from the um, silicone material. We obtained one control for each IOL type. Um, with the exception of the PMMA and hydrophilic acrylic lens, all of these were, um, were matched to the uh, model and manufacturer. For the PMMA and hydrophilic lenses, the model and manufacturer were unknown. Um, so we selected lenses from the similar material. And in this case, we did not select um, lenses, control lenses for each lens based on the power of the lens because Akane et al. had shown that the diopteric power um, did not cause variation in uh, light transmission uh, measurements if the single beam configuration and the integrating sphere uh, were um, set up were used, and that's what we've been using all along in our spectrophotometer. And we've seen that in our own studies as well. So we went ahead and our, our primary outcome measures were again surface light scattering and light transmission and these were measured in the same way as, as in the previous study. We found again that the surface light scattering was comparatively higher in the hydrophobic acrylic Acrosoft ILLs and particularly in the three-piece design. And this, uh, this is interesting because the three-piece design is the design that was introduced first and characteristically has had the longest duration of implantation in our studies. And it, we took all, we pooled all of the data for the Acrosoft lenses and um, we had 18 lenses overall from the Acrosoft material type. One of them, we did not know the dates of implantation, so we did not include it in this data set. Um, and here we've plotted the surface light scattering over time uh, of implantation and you can see that um, there's a strong correlation or tendency for um, this to increase with time. The correlation coefficient for this was 0 0.7, so quite high. Here we have um, some representative images of the results we got for the surface light scattering. These four images are of the hydrophobic acrylic type. Um, the first three are all the Acrosoft material. Top two are the one-piece design with and without blue light filter. You can see they have moderate levels of surface light scattering um, in the 50s and 60s for the anterior and posterior surfaces. The third lens here, lens C, is a um, hydrophobic acrylic Acrosoft lens with a three-piece design, characteristically longer duration of implantation, um, and has quite high levels of surface light, light scattering, the 197 to 182. And these three lenses, you can also see these little um, bright dots inside the lens, if you look closely, are consistent with glistenings. The fourth, the fourth picture was a surprise to us. It was unexpected. Um, this is the Sensar lens. It has been studied um, in one small study clinically before, um, where time fluid images were taken, and no significant um, backscatter was seen in any part of the lens. So this is interesting because we do, in we do indeed find low levels of surface light scattering, but there's this bright, diffuse uh, reflectivity throughout the middle of the lens um, and had not been seen before. It is also different than, than other things that you see that can lead to light scattering in the middle, but those would all have um, focal brightness instead of this diffuse lightness throughout. Um, so we, our initial thoughts on this are that, that the previous study that did not show any um, of this internal scattering was done clinically um, in non-explanted IOLs and so they weren't subjected to the um, preservation processes that occur with explantation. Um, one of these is the um, introduction into formalin and, and we'd like to do some further work up to find see if we can figure that out because at least for the Acrosoft lens, studies have been done to show that the preservation process and the processing that we used in this study um, have not affected the material and led to any changes in light scattering. 
So at this point, we think it may be related to formalin fixation, um, but we're not sure, and we'd like to look into it more. So these next four images are of the other uh, material types. The first is from the hydrophilic acrylic group. Um, then we have a PMMA lens and two lenses, the silicone plate and silicone three-piece lens. And these lenses all behave pretty similarly. There's low levels of surface light scattering um, throughout. The PMA, PMMA lens that you see in the upper right-hand corner had the lowest level of sur surface light scattering and interestingly also had the longest duration of implantation. Um, so at least in these lens types, it does not appear to be related. Um, next, we, we have our results for the light transmission measurements. Um, this, this graph just shows you characteristic um, light transmission curves for each of the lens types. You can see that most of the variation occurs between 400 and 500 nanometers. Again, this first red line is the um, hydrophobic acrylic one piece with blue light filter, and you can see that that has onset of action around 500 nanometers. The rest of them all group pretty tightly around 400 nanometers, and you see most of the variation is due to the onset of action of the, of the UV blocker. Overall, our, our results for this um, showed very, very tight grouping between the, the explanted lenses and the control lens for each group. Um, the one small exception for this was uh, the PMMA and, and the hydrophilic acrylic groups, and these are the groups, just remember, that we did not know the manufacturer for each of the explanted lenses, and so um, we thought that a lot of this variation was probably due to differences in the UV blocker, and in this next slide, you can see we graphed out all of the PMMA lenses, and you can see that the the variation, again, very tightly grouped up until around 400 nanometers where um, it appears that the UV blocker um, is different from manufacturer to manufacturer and induce this variation um, because some of that is included in the, the wavelengths that we measured from 400 to 700 nanometers or our visual spectrum. Another interesting finding that we had was in the silicone plate IOLs, and you can see that this one uh, light transmission curve is very different than the others. And it appears that this, this one lens um, was, was manufactured before the incorporation of the UV blocker, so quite early, and um, does not have that steep downslope um, below 400 nanometers. This didn't affect our results significantly because the, uh, the calculations that we did were uh, taking into account the visual spectrums for 400 to 7 nanometers, where the other lenses also had uh, full transmission. So in conclusion, this is the first study that's been done to evaluate light scattering and light transmittance <coughs> in IOLs manufactured from different materials. One of the interesting findings that we had is that we consistently did not see a decrease in light transmission um, correlating to light scattering. Um, although previous and very early studies on light scattering done by Matsushima and Yoshida et al. had shown that had shown a significant decrease in the few lenses that they did um, in lenses that, that had surface light scattering. And those lenses, at least for the three from Matsushima, they were dislocated not for visual complaints, but for dislocation. Um, and so the patients seemed to be seeing fine until, until the lens dislocated. And um, some other differences between their studies and ours are that um, at that time, Consistent protocols had not been developed for the study of, the, of surface light scattering. Um, it was a qualitative um, diagnosis. They did not use a shine fluid camera to measure quantitatively the, the, the backscatter. And um, they also used a different method to uh, measure the, the light transmission, and that can induce some variation. Uh, I believe they also used, they used a, double, uh, a double beam instead of a single beam setup, but I'm not sure about that. So our study shows grow adds to the growing series of studies showing high levels of surface light scattering in the Acrosoft material. Um, the surface light scattering value levels of other hydrophobic acrylic material analyzed, as well as the hydrophilic acrylic PMMA and silicone lenses are comparatively low. Our study did have some limitations. Um, one was the unav unavailability of hydrophilic acrylic and PMMA IOLs um, for manufacturing material and design match controls. The, the light scattering that we're measuring is, is back scatter, um, as we're shining the light towards the, the model and then it's bouncing back into the camera. Um, there are methods to measure uh, forward scatter, um, 
and so that was one of the one of the limitations is that we were only measuring the light the, the back scatter um, also light transmission while important does not account for the whole of the visual spec uh, visual experience so further in vitro studies are needed to more completely evaluate the visual quality and visual experience and we're currently working on collaborations to study modulated transfer function and, and forward light scattering and other measures to better understand um, the image that's actually being projected through the optic. Um, here are my references. And I'd like to thank um, Dr. Werner and Dr. Mamlis uh, for this whole year. Dr. Werner has been an incredible mentor working on these projects. Very, very excited. It makes me excited about the project too. And, um, and also very um, generous with her time to help me. Dr. Mamlis has been an incredible mentor in the clinic. Um, with pathology, I've learned a lot of things I never knew existed. Uh, Mary Mayfield and the Pathfellows have been incredibly welcoming and good friends this year. Um, but not only have they welcomed me to the, the um, academic environment here, they've also showed me some of the finer points of Utah life. Um, Dr. Werner has in introduced me to the joys of Brazilian barbecue and also, and of course, the Costco chocolate cake. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mamlis took my wife and I up to Park City and introduced us to the mountain biking trails up there in the fall, the beautiful colors. He didn't want me to take a picture of him at the time, but later on I snuck a picture of him when he was on one of the harder parts of the trail. There's a picture of Dr. Mamlis in action. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>